But what will, the, what will the next threat, the next outbreak be? It could be a coronavirus again, could be another coronavirus. It could be an influenza virus because they evolve quickly. It is absolutely essential for us to, to support research on dangerous new viruses, what they call emerging viruses, new viruses that come out of wild animals and get into humans. With every book I write about science, I'm trying to create literature. I'm trying to create a work of literature that changes the way the reader sees the world. And oh yes, also I'm explaining science. The question of the origins of the virus. That's the elephant in the room. There are two main schools of thought, not equal schools of thought, but opposing schools of thought. One natural virus spilled over from a wild animal, such as has happened many times in the past that we know about, including SARS-1, SARS-CoV-1 in 2003, a coronavirus that came out of bats. We know this happens. We know this virus is very similar. Uh, to many viruses that have been found in bats. We know how this kind of virus evolves. It mutates. It also switches segments with other viruses. If two viruses infect the same animal at the same time, their genomes can trade sections. And that explains this kind of a virus. But there are people who want to believe, first of all, that this was an engineered virus made by malicious scientists in a lab and released intentionally. The best molecular evolutionary virologists in the world have told me, no, no, that's not true. We can tell looking at this virus, that is not what happened. Then there's people who want to say, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a wild virus, but it was taken into a lab and manipulated and changed a little bit, and then it leaked from a laboratory. That's a story that's more dramatic, that's more sinister than the natural spillover story, but there is no, there is no evidence for it. There is no evidence that this virus ever existed in any laboratory that we know of. And it, if it never existed in a laboratory, it can't leak from a laboratory. So it's difficult to prove a negative. It's difficult to prove, no, it didn't leak from a laboratory. But to claim that that is an equal possibility, you need evidence. And there is no evidence. At the beginning, the politicians were unprepared particularly certain politicians. The president of my country was unprepared to deal with this. But science knew what was coming. Public health knew what was coming. They had issued warnings. There will be a pandemic of this sort. We can't say when, and we can't say exactly what kind of virus, but we can say that it'll be an RNA virus that evolves quickly, like, for instance, a coronavirus. The political leaders had these advisors talking to them, but the political leaders as I've said in the book, did not have the imagination to, to foresee how bad it would be to face this pandemic unprepared, to face this pandemic in denial of its seriousness. The next threat, there will be, there will be more spillovers. A virus coming from a wild animal, getting into one human, getting into a few humans, maybe making a dozen or two dozen people sick. Uh, an outbreak. That will happen. Whether it becomes a pandemic or not depends on what we do and how prepared we are. But what will, the, what will the next threat, the next outbreak be? It could be a coronavirus again, could be another coronavirus. It could be an influenza virus because they evolve quickly. And they spill from birds into pigs and into people. And sometimes birds into pigs and then into people. Avian influenza, high pathogenicity H5N1 avian influenza is a virus that's out there. Scientists are watching it. So far, it's not very dangerous to humans because it, it can only occasionally infect humans and it does not transmit from human to human. But with a few mutations, it could become capable of effective infection and transmission in humans, and that would be very dangerous. It is absolutely essential for us to, to support research on dangerous new viruses, what they call emerging viruses, new viruses that come out of wild animals and get into humans. We have to study that. We have to study that in the wild. We have to be sending scientists out into the tropical forests and into caves and to other places where wild animals carry 
strange viruses that could become human viruses, and we need to study those viruses in laboratories. It's controversial. Some people say those experiments in laboratories are too dangerous. The people who claim that this is a, a virus that resulted from a laboratory leak argue that research on such viruses is too dangerous. Well, there's no evidence that this was a laboratory leak, and there's a lot of evidence that it was a natural spillover. And it's important that we study these viruses in laboratories because it helps us predict what might be coming. Well, these, these vaccines have been developed very quickly, especially the, well, including the mRNA vaccines, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, also the AstraZeneca, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine from, from the United Kingdom, developed very, very quickly, and yet they have been shown through testing to be extremely effective, as effective as any vaccines virtually that, that have ever been produced. We know how to do that quickly now, and, and anyone who understands science and, and, and really looks at reliable information can see that these vaccines are, uh, are savers of lives. They, save, they have saved millions of lives already. On March 2nd of 2020, my publisher said to me, would you write a book about the pandemic? And I thought, yes, I have to if they want me to. It's, it's a duty, not an opportunity. So I signed a contract for a book about the pandemic, and then I had to think about how do I write a book about this pandemic, about which there are going to be hundreds of other books. How do I write a book that's unique and valuable and different? And how do I do it without being able to travel? Usually I travel. I go there. I go to the Congo, and I watch scientists uh, looking for Ebola virus, and I go to China and I climbed through caves with scientists catching bats and looking for viruses. I knew I wasn't going to be able to travel. So I thought about it for the rest of 2020. I did some other things. Mostly I thought about how do I do this book. And at the very end of 2020, around Christmas, I got the idea of how I could do it. I'll make the virus itself my main character. I'll write about the origins and evolution of this virus and its fierce journey through the human population. And I will write about the scientists who study it around the world. 60 or 70, and eventually it became 95 experts around the world. I will talk to them all by Zoom. I will ask them about the virus and their work on the virus. But I will also ask them about their lives during the pandemic, their lives as teachers, their lives as parents, their lives as spouses and I will use their voices to tell the story of the virus from the beginning. I do journalism and I write books. So I'm a science journalist and I'm an author of science books. Some people say, well, that means your job is to explain science. No, <clears throat> partly my job is to explain science. But with every book I write about science, I'm trying to create literature. I'm trying to create a work of literature that has beauty, that has suspense, that has surprise, that has human characters, that makes the reader want to turn the page, that changes the way the reader sees the world. And oh yes, also I'm explaining science. With every sentence I write, with every paragraph I write, I think about the reader and I try to give the reader not just science explanation, but literature that involves the music of language and sometimes humor and, and suspense so that the reader wants to turn the page. <laughs>